Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Dr. Ken Vujise. Um, Ken uh, came to us um, last spring, literally uh, just as the COVID pandemic was um, ramping up. And um, I'm not sure all of you have had a chance to meet him, but I would encourage you to reach out to him after his talk today. Um, we were really lucky to recruit uh, Ken. Ken came to the US uh, from uh, Japan. He trained in uh, New York and did his cardiology training there and then moved to Texas uh, to do his interventional uh, training. And I didn't realize it, but I think we were in Houston together at the same, same time, very briefly. Um, after his interventional fellowship, he did a molecular biology fellowship there and stayed on faculty um, and sort of built up his uh, lab. Um, he then went on to be the director of the Division of Cardiology at UTMB uh, Galveston uh, before coming to us. Uh, Ken has had two lives. Uh, one is as an interventional cardiologist, and he's published extensively on clinical issues related to interventional cardiology. And the second has been um, his uh, basic uh, research and the laboratory that he runs. He um, has focused on, uh, in recent years, on this molecule of portillin, um, initially in, uh, in its role in atherosclerosis, then as a protein regulating apoptosis, and now um, has expanded that into a number of different clinical um, uh, uh, areas. He is exceedingly well-funded. He is PI on two RO1s, co-PI on a third, and just uh, received a third percentile on a third um, um, RO1. Um, he uh, serves as the section head over um, um, at Harborview and is the holder uh, of the um, uh, Lock Dodge uh, Chair um, in Cardiovascular Medicine. So uh, welcome, Ken, and welcome to the University of Washington, and I look forward to your talk. Please send any questions you have through the Q&A um, chat session or raise your hand and we'll get to them at the end of this talk. You want to take it away, Ken? Yes. All right. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, nice meeting you all. Um, so the title of today's talk is Fortening Bench to Bedside. So before I start, I want to take this opportunity and thank um, Rob for a great introduction and also uh, Gavin for arranging this talk. And also uh, all of you, you uh, have cardiology faculty for being here. Uh, today's goals are number one, to understand the biology of fortinin. And number two is to understand the role of fortinin in human diseases. Um, and then the uh, audience is you all. So I was born and brought up in Tokyo, Japan, a very, very downtown blue color district of Tokyo, Japan. And I attended the Kyoto University School of Medicine um, and I was not a good medical student. I kept sneaking out of the classroom and went to the, the basic lab and wanted to do some research. I really wanted to be a physician scientist from the get-go. And I was fortunate uh, to have great professors like uh, Tasuka Honjo. Uh, he was uh, my uh, biochemistry teacher uh, and also now is a Nobel laureate. And then um, uh, Kyoto University has been a home for uh, great professors like uh, Shinya Yamanaka, also Nobel laureate. So after finishing up my uh, cardiology training, um, including two years of uh, research training at the University of uh, Texas Houston, um, I was allowed to open up my lab after receiving a small grant uh, from American Heart Association. And that's when we initiated the screening procedure to identify a new protein. Um, and then after probably a year and a half of a screening procedure, we have discovered this molecule by the name of fortinin, which is a topic of today's, uh, today's talk, 1997. I stayed on as faculty at the UT Houston for just about 12 years, and I moved to the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas in 2007 
and stayed there uh, for just about 12 years to continue the characterization of this molecule. 2020, thanks to Rob and uh, everyone else, I was able to move my lab from Galveston to Seattle and then continue um, uh, the research on Fortini. So I would like to take this opportunity and recognize one of the greatest mentors I've ever had, um, James T. Willison. Um, he uh, passed away just about three months ago. Um, and then I'm thankful uh, for his support. He placed me on his uh, NIH uh, training grant so that uh, I can study two straight years uh, the molecular biology. And also uh, he asked uh, two of his very prominent molecular biologists to coach me in the lab. And also he helped me to help me secure a KO8 um, and also appointed me as a physician scientist track assistant professor when I completed uh, my uh, research training. Uh, not only that, he helped me uh, set up the lab in the Institute of Molecular Medicine when I obtained my first uh, grant funding. So we will miss him. But anyway, um, the uh, fortin was discovered by East 2 hybrid screening. And for those who know East 2 hybrid screening, it's a robust East genetic based screening procedure. You identify bait protein and in this case was MCL1. And MCL1 is a uh, BCL2 family member protein and macrophage survival factor. And then um, I was interested in uh, atherosclerosis, um, being trained in interventional cardiology. Uh, I wanted to study atherosclerosis. And then macrophages uh, play an important role in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. So that's why I chose MCL1 as bait protein. And then I went into a human cDNA library to try to identify a protein partner or partners of MCL1. So after a year and a half of screening procedures, uh, I was able to identify fortinin. And um, fortinin was ligated, cDNA was ligated to a library protein portion of activating domain. So when bait protein, i.e. MCL1, and fortinin, one of the library proteins, interact with each other. DNA binding domain and activating domain are brought together to activate the transcription of reporter genes. That would allow the yeast cells to grow in nutritionally deficient media and also turn blue uh, upon XGL assay because beta gel gene is also activated as a reporter. So the protein, also known as translationally controlled tumor protein, is highly conserved across the species. The, uh, it is ubiquitously expressed across tissue and organs. And then within the cell, protein exists in the nucleus as well as perinuclear area of the cytosol. That is true for immunohistochemistry. Um, Fortinin is present both in the nucleus and cytosolic portion of the cell. When we devised ELISA to measure uh, the blood fortinin concentration, uh, to our surprise, fortinin was present in the blood uh, at the concentration of 30 to 150 nanogram per milliliter. The role of circulating fortinin uh, remains unknown. But to summarize, fortinin is present in the nucleus as well as in the cytosol and extracellular space. So next question, big question was that what fortinin does in the cell? Because um, fortinin interacted with one of the anti-epoptotin molecule, our first hypothesis was that fortinin functions as an anti-apoptotic molecule. We created the stable cell line over expressing fortinin and then stimulated the, the cell um, with a topocyte. And as you see from this figure, fortinin over expressing cell, cells um, undergo cell death less, significantly less in response to a topocyte. And a topocyte is apoptosis 
uh, inducing agent. And then uh, we performed caspase 3 uh, activation assay. And as you see from this figure, when 14 is overexpressed, uh, caspase activation is less in, compare, in comparison with control cells. One of our competitors did a PERP cleavage assay. Um, they silenced TCTP or fortinine from macrophage cell line and then demonstrated as soon as they silenced fortinine from the uh, macrophage cell line, PERP was cleaved. And then uh, PERP cleavage is one of the manifestation, uh, manifestations of apoptosis. So fortinine is an anti-apoptotic molecule. So next question is that how fortinin functions as an anti-apoptotic molecule. So because fortinin binds MCL1, and MCL1 is uh, in and of itself anti-apoptotic molecule, our second hypothesis was that fortinin binds MCL1 and prolongs uh, its half-life. Initially, we did a procedure called a co-immunoprecipitation assay to demonstrate um, that the fortinin and MCL1 interacted within a cell in a specific way. And then this is a co-immunoprecipitation assay uh, supporting that. And then um, uh, one of the labs uh, did a half-life assay in the presence and in the absence of fortinin. And then they measured uh, rough half-lives of MCL1, both in the presence and in the absence of fortinin after cyclohexamide treatment. And as you know, cyclohexamide uh, blocks uh, de novo protein synthesis. So as you see from this uh, Western blot analysis, as well as this graph densitometry uh, depiction of this Western blot, in the absence of fortinin, MCL1 concentration drops rapidly. But in the presence of TCTP or fortinin, the uh, MCL1 stays. So because of that, fortinin binds and stabilizes MCL1. So it appears that the fortinin goes through MCL1 to protect cells against apoptosis. But is there any other pathways? Can fortinin function as an anti-apoptotic molecule without MCL1? To test that hypothesis, we decided to create a, a cell line that overexpresses um, fortinin, and then utilizing siRNA system to deplete MCL1 from the cells. So this um, portion, uh, the uh, row number, uh, column number one through six, those uh, groups lack MCL1 totally. There's no detectable MCL1. If fortinin has to go through MCL1 to be anti-apoptotic, in the absence of MCL1, fortinin shouldn't be able to function as an anti-apoptotic molecule. So, and then we manipulated the concentration, intracellular concentration of fortinin using siRNA. So as you see in this Western blood, fortinin concentration varies from almost zero to robust fortinin expression in the absence and presence of MCL1. And as you see from this West, uh, Western blood, as well as apoptosis assay, uh, stimulating those cells um, with 5-FU, or apoptosis inducing agent, as you see from this graph, in the absence of MCL1, as fortinin concentration increased within the cell, those cells died less, suggesting fortinin is anti-apoptotic molecule even without MCL1. So that tells us fortinin can function as an anti-apoptotic molecule even without MCL1. But is there any other molecules that the fortinin is working with in prevention of apoptosis? So as you may remember, fortinin is present in the nucleus. And there are several very well-known pro-apoptotic transcriptional factors in the nucleus, and one of which is P53. And then 
another famous uh, transcriptional factor in the nucleus that would facilitate apoptosis is a retinoblastoma uh, protein product. So we performed a co-immunoprecipitation assay uh, between folding and P53 and folding and retinoblastoma gene product. And then only P53 interacted with folding. Uh, we were excited about the discovery um, and then performed a detailed co-immunoprecipitation assay. And then as you see from this figure, uh, when you pull down P53 from the total cell lysate using anti-P53 antibody, fortinine gets co-immunoprecipitated, suggesting that the fortinine and P53 interact with each other. And then uh, we did a traditional or a standard Luciferase assay to show in the presence of P53, the, uh, if fortinine is overexpressed, P53 is not as capable um, to induce P53 target genes. To see whether or not fortinine blocks P53 induced apoptosis, we turn to two cell systems. One is U2OS cell and another is South cell. Both are osteosarcoma cell lines. Um, however, U2OS cell uh, has wild type P53 and South cell has mutated uh, P53. So when you do a Western blot analysis using anti-P53 antibody, you don't see any P53 in South cells. And then we over expressed in those cell lines, either empty uh, retrovirus vector or fortinine or fortinine point mutant that lacks binding to 53. So this fortinine doesn't bind 53. And then we induced 53 uh, mediated apoptosis by subjecting those cells to UV irradiation. And if you take a look um, this graph, when you subject um, U2S cell that has only empty retrovirus vector and subject the cell line to UV irradiation, apoptosis goes from here all the way up to here. But in the presence of fortinine, you cannot induce apoptosis after UV irradiation. So apoptosis comes down from here to here. But then if you overexpress express fortinine, which is incapable of binding P53, you cannot prevent UV radiation induced apoptosis. But what's more striking is that in the absence of P53, like a cell cells, the presence or the absence of fortinine doesn't matter. Neither cell lines uh, exhibit uh, apoptosis. Uh, in response to UV irradiation. So taken together, fortinine binds P53 and blocks P53 dependent apoptosis. So one day we are doing an experiment to test uh, uh, the hypothesis. Maybe fortinine uh, doesn't protect cells under reactive oxygen species induced apoptosis. And as you know, apoptosis can be caused by many stresses, right, including P53 or um, DNA damage or reactive oxygen species or cell stress, like an endoplasmic reticulum induced cell stress. So when we are testing whether or not reactive oxygen species can, can um, the, the apoptosis uh, due to reactive oxygen species can be prevented by fortinine. Fortinine did prevent reactive oxygen species induced apoptosis, but P53 um, has nothing to do with reactive oxygen species induced apoptosis. So we need to look for molecule or molecules that fortinine work with or you know go through goes through to prevent reactive oxygen species induced apoptosis. To do that we decided to do a massive uh, co-immunum precipitation screening where we created the two types of bees. One is empty bees and another is fortinine coated bees. And then we created the liters of acetyl lysate and then uh, immunoprecipitated um, 
all the photon interacting proteins. Uh, and then this is a band. So there are many photon interacting proteins. And we looked specifically for uh, genes that would handle reactive oxygen species. And we found PRX1. And then, as you may know, PRX1 is the peroxy reductin 1. This is an enzyme um, that detoxify hydrogen peroxide and other reactive oxygen species into water. Uh, we confirmed, first of all, the presence of specific interaction between those two molecules by co-immunoprecipitation assay. And we performed the PLA, or approximately ligation assay, to demonstrate co-localization of those two molecules. And then, uh, moreover, we did a biolayer interferometry to make sure those proteins are uh, interacting directly with each other. And in fact, those proteins are interacting with each other at the dissociation constant of 124 nanomolar. We did a, a test tube uh, enzymic assay. And I, as you see, uh, I don't know how, you, how well you can see from your screen, but this is a PRX1 alone. And then a substrate is NADPH. And then a PRX1 detoxify hydrogen peroxide into water molecules. Okay, so within 30 minutes, uh, the NADH consumption goes from here all the way down here in the presence of only PRX1. But what is surprising is that when you add photonin to the reaction mix, the reaction goes more rapidly from here all the way down here, which is depicted in this graph. So the uh, enzymic activity goes from here to here in the presence of photonin. But when you add photonin point mutant, which fail to interact with PRX1, there's no change, just, a, just an incremental change from here to here. So taken together, photonin binds PRX1 and potentiate its anti-reactive oxygen species mediated apoptosis. So it's getting more confusing and it can get even more confusing when we tested uh, the photon's ability to block ER stress-induced apoptosis. We induced the uh, ER-induced uh, apoptosis using stress-inducing uh, reagents like a tapicagin and others, and then uh, overexpressed photonin. And we discovered that the photonin does block the ER stress-induced apoptosis as well. So there are three molecules that play an important role in ER stress-induced apoptosis. As you know, one is PARK, P-E-R-K, another is IRE1-alpha, and still other is ATF6. And then photonin only interact with IRE1-alpha, as is shown in this co-immunoprecipitation assay. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into this uh, experiment in detail, but as you see that uh, um, when you pull down photonin using anti-photonin antibody, IRE1-alpha, both phosphorylated and activated, and also inactivated IRE1, both gets immunoprecipitated. And then also, you know, the PLA or proximity ligation assay confirms uh, the finding. And then from, from this uh, assay, we also found and confirmed that the fourteen preferentially bind phosphorylated the version of IRE1-alpha. IRE1-alpha is activated when it's phosphorylated. So function-wise, IRE1-alpha has two domains. One is RNA processing domain, and another is kinase domain. So we tested whether or not the binding of fourteen to IRE1-alpha would block both domains, and it, it did. So as you see this uh, from this figure, when you add fourteen to the reaction mixture, IRE1-alpha cannot process RNA. RNA. And then one of the major RNA gets processed by RE1-alpha is XPP1. So when 14 is present, 
uh, IRE1 alpha cannot generate enough XDP1S. And also, kinase domain uh, was inhibited by fortinine. So taken together, our working hypothesis right now is that fortinine binds to activated IRE1 alpha and protect IRE1 alpha from executing um, apoptosis pathway. So in other words, when fortinine is present, IRE1 alpha cannot execute apoptosis activities. So it is really, really becoming confusing. And fortinine binds MCL1, P53, PRX1, and IRV, IRE1 alpha, and all protecting cells against apoptosis. What is a common theme? What exactly fortinine does? Is there any other molecules like fortinine that does this type of things? Right now, to summarize, fortinine positively regulate, regulates anti-apoptotic molecules like MCL1 and PRX1, as I showed you uh, the evidence of. And also fortinine negatively regulates pro-apoptotic molecules such as P53 and IRE1 alpha. And also, please notice, regulation occurs all through interacting with the target molecules. So fortinine needs uh, physical interaction to be effective. So fortinine doesn't obviously function well under social distancing. Um, but anyway, fortinine regulation occurs by modulating the target partners by phosphorylation in case of PRX1 or half-life prolongation in the case of MCL1 or blocking of the binding of the partner molecule to its target, like P53. Fortinine binds P53 and prevent P53 from binding the promoter area of pro-apoptotic molecules. So right now, this is our kind of working uh, hypothesis or idea. Fortinine fine tunes cell microenvironment toward survival, working together with many pro and anti-apoptotic molecules. So fortinine uh, research has been gaining uh, more traction from the scientific community. When we cloned fortinine uh, back in 1997, we had less than 10 uh, articles published on PubMed. But right now, the last time I checked a couple months ago, we have more than 500 uh, manuscripts on PubMed. The, uh, just to summarize uh, molecular attributes of fortinine before moving to a uh, translational uh, segment of the talk. Uh, fortinine is also known as TCTP, or translationally controlled tumor protein. It's a small molecule, 172 amino acid polypeptide, and um, 19 kilodalton on SDS page gel. It's localized in the nucleus, cytosol, endoplasmic reticulum, as well as extracellular space. Um, protein partners, um, MCL1, P53, PRX1, IRE1 alpha, actin, and also tubulin. All right. The uh, biological function, as I mentioned, is blocks apoptosis by augmenting the function of anti-apoptotic molecules and also mitigating the function of pro-apoptotic molecules. We do have genetically modified mice, uh, if you're interested in collaborating with us. Uh, human disease-wise, I'm gonna show two examples today in the following slides that fortinine facilitates atherosclerosis and also fortinine is important in expansion of beta cell mass. Uh, fortinine inhibitors are reported, but no of those reported uh, inhibitors are good one because dissociation constant is still very high. So as a physician scientist, um, our usual approach is start from disease or diseases, right? And then identify molecules 
that contribute to the disease progression or disease entity and try to discover inhibitors or agonists in, in the hope of modifying the disease process for the better. For instance, in atherosclerosis research, uh, the um, lipid hypothesis was uh, the uh, predominant hypothesis as to how atherosclerosis occurs. And as you know, Joe Goldstein and uh, Michael Brown uh, identified the target molecule to address lipid hypothesis by discovering HMG co-redictase to be the key enzyme. And then uh, they went on uh, to discover statins working together with big pharmas. And then uh, um, clinical trial, trials indeed show that the statin drastically improve uh, the atherosclerosis and its complications. However, our situation was a little bit different. We started with fortening one molecule. So we needed to identify the disease or diseases in which fortening play a major role. So we have to exercise our knowledge in molecular biology and cell biology that we had on fortening to identify diseases uh, that fortening plays an important role in. So right now, um, two examples are diabetes and atherosclerosis. But good news is that since we've been focusing on fortening for over 20 years, we have a lot of reagents including inhibitors, SI and SHRNA, and the microRNA activators. Uh, so once we identify disease ent entity in which fortin plays an important role, then it's easier for us to uh, investigate those disease entities. So I wanna just give you two examples today, fortin and diabetes first. So as you may know that the uh, islet cells expand uh, before and after birth. This is day one after birth, and this is 12 weeks after birth, and this is uh, immunostaining using anti-insulin antibody. And as you see here, this is islet cell. Starts small and expand. But then take a look at the fortening immunostaining. Uh, TCTP is fortening, right? So it's over, you know, the abundantly expressed before birth, but after birth, by 12 weeks, we don't have any signal of fortin expression in islet cells. So fortin expression in beta cell is developmentally regulated and it appears after birth. So when you knock out fortin from islet cells like this, um, using um, uh, flux technology, then you will shrink the beta cell mass. So this is the um, um, fortin knockout in islet cells, and this is wild type. And as you see from this um, immunohistochemistry, the black dots are islet cells, or brown dots are islet cells. So islet cell mass shrinks in the absence of fortin, suggesting fortin deficiency in beta cells decrease beta cell mass in the pancreas. And uh, uh, the phenotype of that is in insulin intolerance. As you see, this is, uh, you know, the, the uh, glucose tolerance test and black dots are fortin in knockout uh, mice and then uh, clearly exhibit uh, glucose intolerance. Not only that, fortin is important, appears to be important for the expansion of beta cell mass. So this is the uh, normal diet and this is a high fat diet. And take a look, this is a wild type uh, mice uh, on normal diet. This is an islet cell and a high fat diet. So islet cells are capable of expanding themselves upon high fat diet under increased insulin requirement from here to here. But in the absence of fortin in islet cells, uh, islet cell starts small and it's not capable of expanding itself, um, leading to glucose intolerance. So to summarize, um, the lack of appropriate fortin in beta cells leads to a smaller beta cell mass and glucose intolerance, which is exacerbated by high fat diet. Fortin overexpression in beta cell may protect against 
high fat diet induced glucose intolerance, but this hypothesis hasn't been tested. So how about fortinine and atherosclerosis? Because fortinine interacted with MCL1, and MCL1 is a macrophage survival factor, and then macrophages uh, facilitate atherosclerosis, our initial hypothesis was fortinine promotes atherosclerosis. And then, in fact, if you take a look at the uh, human samples, carotid and arctectomy samples from minor atherosclerotic region, like a fibrous plaque, to severe, um, actually fatty streak, to a mature fibrous plaque with plenty um, crystal, crystallized crystal or crystals here, the fortinine signal increases drastically uh, from here. Uh, indicated in brown DAB color to a massive expression. And if you magnify uh, this area, um, you notice that fortinine expression is localized in the area of foam cell accumulation. And foam cell, as you know, is a macrophage deri deri derivative, derivatives that has taken up oxidized LDL. So we confirmed our observation using hypercholesterolemic mice by incubating them uh, for 10 weeks to up to 50 weeks, allowing them to develop robust atherosclerosis. This is a trileaflet aortic valve, and this uh, shows severe atherosclerosis um, at the age of 50 um, uh, in this hypercholesterolemic mice. If you stain those tissue with anti fortinine and anti macrophage antibodies, you see, as you see here, fortinine expression is robust as atherosclerosis progressed and also coexisted in the area of macrophage abundance. So, fortinine and macrophage signals appear to increase drastically as atherosclerosis progressed. Number two, fortinine and macrophage signals co-localized in atherosclerotic lesions. So to establish causal relationship between fortinine and atherosclerosis, we really needed to have fortinine knockout mice. However, our approach, initial approach was constitutional knockout of fortinine. By deleting entire, fortinine has six exons, I wanted to delete everything. So I deleted everything, but then unfortunately phenotype was uh, too drastic that the embryo couldn't survive more than three and a half days after conception. So 14 uh, homozygously deficient mice all died after three and a half days, um, even before implantation to the placenta. However, good news was that 14 heterozygous knockout uh, was fertile and appeared normal. So right away, we decided to cross those uh, heterozygous fortinine knockout mice uh, with uh, the uh, hypercholesterolemic mice, like LDL receptor apobec one double knockout, which is considered by many to be the uh, most, most uh, faithful human mo uh, mass model of human familial hypercholesterolemia. So uh, we did a uh, fairly big experiment. As soon as we got enough number of mice, we uh, um, go ahead and incubated those mice for 10 months on no macho diet. We didn't want to feed high fat diet to skew the uh, manifestation of atherosclerosis. We didn't want to have too much uh, foam cell formation. And then after 10 months, we subjected uh, those mice to a standard atherosclerosis assay. And then there was no difference in blood pressure or body weight and lipid profiles are identical between two groups. And in that uh, system, we were able to demonstrate in the lack of fortinine, um, the atherosclerosis was significantly less. The, the reduction was only 27%, but that was considered to be due to the fact this is heterozygous knockout instead of homozygous knockout of fortinine. So next question was that, which tissue type or cell type is driving this phenotype? And of course, the uh, most uh, promising hypothesis was that because fortinine interacted with MCL1, and MCL1 is a macrophage survival factor, fortinine drives 
atherosclerosis through macrophages. So we wanted to knock out photonin in macrophage and the related uh, cell lines. We didn't have, um, we created the flux uh, photonin mice, but as you know, it's very difficult to knock out a, you know, certain gene only in macrophages. Um, only a, a method that was available at that time was LISM, uh, CRE transgenic. So we went ahead and crossed 14 flux mice with the LISM CRE transgene mice to generate uh, macro, uh, the uh, mice that lacks 14 expression in macrophages and other myeloid lineage cells. And as you see from this uh, Western blot analysis, this is wild type 14, and this is no cut 14, and the macrophage does not um, express any photonin detectable by Western blot analysis. And this is wild type, and the wild type macrophage express robust amount of photonin. So um, that we wanted to put this mice strain on the hypercholesterolemic genetic, genetic background to test this very hypothesis that the macrophage photonin facilitates atherosclerosis in hypercholesterolemic mice. So it took us like uh, almost half half year. Um, it's a complex genotype, but eventually we are able to put uh, wild type um, and also uh, macrophage specific photonin knockout mice uh, on the hypercholesterolemic genetic background. So we did the same exact atherosclerosis assay. We didn't want to use a high fat diet, so I ended up incubating those mice for eight months. But at the end of the eight months, um, we are able to get some very interesting data. To our surprise, by knocking out photon from macrophages, uh, those mice uh, was a little bit heavier than control mice. We don't know why. We are still investigating uh, the metabolic profiles of these mice. Uh, however, the lipid profile exactly identical. So we uh, harvested the bone marrow and uh, generated the bone marrow induced macrophages for, from uh, wild type and 14 knockout mice. And then to our surprise, those uh, uh, macrophages lacking 14 cannot just take up any oxidized LDL. There was zero uh, form cell formation. So when you knock out 14 from macrophages, macrophages lose its ability, the ability to take up any oxidized LDL. We performed a uh, influx, efflux assay, ABCD assay, and uh, phagocyte analysis, but everything was identical um, except uh, macrophage polarization assay. And we hypothesized that the fortinine deficiency may polarize macrophages to a certain way. Uh, in, in, in a certain way. So we did a macrophage fingerprinting uh, in relation to a polarization status. So then we found as soon as you knock that fortinine from macrophages, those macrophages appear to polarize to M2 macrophages. And M2 macrophages, as you know, um, are anti-inflammatory macrophages and M1 macrophages are pro-inflammatory uh, uh, pro atherosclerotic macrophages. So, in that system, this time we saw a drastic phenotype 53% uh, reduction by inface assay um, when you knocked out 14 uh, from macrophages and also myeloid lineage cells. So, right now, uh, this is a current working hypothesis. In a baseline status, uh, the macrophage does not necessarily express a lot of photon in it. But then uh, those macrophages are uh, uh, placed in a pro inflammatory microenvironment or oxidized LDL or even hyperglycemic uh, environment. Then the photon induction occurs and the induced photon uh, is going to protect macrophages against apoptosis allow them to survive in the atherosclerotic intima, and also even allow them to proliferate. Not only that, overexpressed protein would polarize macrophages from M2 to M1. M1 macrophages are pro-inflammatory macrophages, and 
um, take up uh, oxidized LDL through their scavenger receptors and contribute to atherosclerosis. So this is our current working hypothesis. To summarize, high cholesterol and atherosclerotic stimuli induces fortening in macrophages. Induced fortening in macrophages protects macrophages against apoptosis, allowing them to become form cells and proliferate. Constitution of fortening deficiency uh, protects mice against atherosclerosis. So it's true for macrophage specific knockout. And uh, our current mechanism, uh, mechanistic explanations um, are as, as follows. Number one, 14 knockout leads to phenotypic changes of macrophages from M1 to M2. And uh, once again, M1 is pro-inflammatory and M2 is anti-inflammatory macrophages. M2 predominance leads to decreased inflammation in the atherosclerotic intima. M2 predominance also leads to less form cell formation. So I'd like to use the last slide to acknowledge uh, those scientists who robustly contributed to the project. Um, from our lab, uh, Dr. Pinkau is a research assistant professor. He started um, as a, a graduate student in my lab over 10 years ago. Uh, Dr. Minako Oda um, is our lab manager, and uh, Nicole Inger is a research scientist. And all these scientists, uh, previous postdocs, uh, who have uh, robustly contributed to the characterization of fortune. In terms of funding support, uh, I cannot be more grateful to UDAV for extremely robust uh, startups, and also UTMB, uh, NHB. BI and American Heart Association together continuously supported my research efforts over the last 20 plus years. And AstraZeneca uh, contributed to the characterization of uh, the role of fortune in atherosclerosis as well. So with that, thank you so much for your attention.